the taste of sweet grapes on the lips, ladies and gentlemen. I am your host, Andrew Echinove. I am always your host. Uh, this is Under the Cork Tree, uh, and I'll get into the podcast name change here in a second, um, but just really quickly, uh, today's show going to be pretty simple, uh, a little shorter than usual, no interviews. I uh, just wanted to do a, a quick little reflection of some kind and just kind of touch base um, and put something out. So uh, again, uh, we'll keep it short, but uh, right before we jump into the podcast, uh, the very first episode I launched was back in January of this year under Run With Bulls podcast. And as you may have heard through other episodes, one of the reasons I named it Run With Bulls podcast Obviously, my, my family is uh, from the Basque Country out in Spain. Uh, I spent a few years there living there as a kid, and I just have a, a bunch of different ties there. My family's all from there. I, I still have lots of friends and obviously family. And I've always dreamed of running with the Bulls. And I've been to the Fiesta there in Pamplona that they have every summer. I've been to the Running of the Bulls. I've watched it. I've been at the Fiesta, the party, but I've never actually run in the streets of the Bulls. And back in January when I launched this podcast, I really started thinking more and more about it. And uh, at first, Run With Bulls was, in the sense of the podcast, for me was really about, look, you know, you don't really have to be in the streets with those bulls to really confront those obstacles and challenges life throws your way. The elements of fear, anxiety, uh, happiness, sadness, whatever. I think that you can really find... Um, different areas of your life where that really applies and and areas where you experience that. So I really feel like in our own way, we all sort of run with bulls, right? In some fashion or another. So uh, I thought it was an appropriate name title, um, whatever you want to call it. And uh, after I launched the podcast, I thought, you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to run with the bulls in Pamplona. Um, So I took a very seriously trained, bought the flight, went and ran with the bulls had an amazing experience and honestly i'm hooked i was hooked from the very first day i took the streets um uh, this past july and i cannot wait until next summer to go back and do it all again and uh yeah what what a blast it was um so yeah um that was really the original thinking behind naming it run with bulls podcast and In retrospect, now that I've really, um, you know, I took that mission head on, took that obstacle head on, went, ran with the bulls, I really wanted this podcast to to kind of morph into something forward looking. And I thought, you know, in terms of the challenges and and obstacles I kind of have ahead of me, um, I just thought it was it was a neat, a neat way to kind of morph this podcast into something different. One that's not maybe so so structured and, and rigid and one that's a little bit more free flowing, um, hint, hint, the wine, uh, uh, just FY, um, just, uh, FYI, I, I definitely do a little drinking before these things now. So, uh, if you've listened to like the last one or two podcasts, um, I'm pretty sure, uh, I've been, um, uh, somewhat juiced up. I'll put it that way. Um, so, uh, so, uh, Hope you ditch the glass and grab the bottle and are ready for some uh, general mindlessness and bullshit as we uh, just kind of chit chat it up. Sometimes I think you'll hear more of like current event stuff. Um, you know, who knows? Could touch anything from politics to sports uh, to just figuring out what someone's been up to, uh, what's going on in their life or whatever seems interesting to talk about. Like I said, it, I just kind of wanted this this podcast to be a little bit more free flowing and open to just kind of chat whatever. So, uh, so I, in terms of like giving you something to expect going forward, hopefully that kind of paints a good picture. All right. Well, with that being said, uh, (laughs) under the cork tree, um, really quickly under the cork tree is basically, um, just kind of paying homage to the Basque country, to Spain. Um, a lot of the corks really, most of the corks that you see um, in bottles these days are, are you know, derived from cork trees out in Portugal or Spain. Um, so I, I just thought it was kind of a neat way of paying homage to back to the to the home country, but also at the same time, 
um, just sort of a, an ode to being a little bit more uh, just kind of relaxed and chill and, and just enjoying it more um, going forward. So cheers to that. Cheers to new beginnings and uh, um, hope you enjoy it. Today's podcast, like I said, no interviews today. Um, I was just kind of dabbling around on Facebook the other day and I've never really been one to post a whole lot. And I know that some of you really, really love posting, uh, love checking in. You might have your Instagram and Snapchat accounts and everything going. I'm probably a little bit behind the curve when it comes to that. I do have a Twitter account, but I think I might only post whenever I upload a podcast. Um, so, uh, yeah. I was on Facebook and I saw a little prompt and I'm not sure if it's always done that or if I just noticed it for the first time. Uh, but a little prompt in Facebook was asking me what makes you happy? I had this little white text box there. It was what makes you happy? And of course, you know, I'm like, you know, a bottle and a half of Rioja wine in and, uh, uh, and, and yeah, so you just kind of start thinking, right? The wheels start spinning. And I was just kind of like, you know, shit, like, you know, like what makes me happy? Right. Um, what makes me happy? And, you know, I just kind of started thinking, is it, you know, a place I go to, is it friends? Is it someone from my family? Uh, you know, binge watching the office on Netflix or is it a song? Is it something that kind of takes you away from your reality? Is it some kind of like temporary mental state? Like, what is that? What makes you happy? Um, You know, is it tangible? Is it intangible? Um, So yeah, the more I thought about it, the more it kind of just threw me for a loop. And at one point I started thinking back to um, this one time, I think it was like two years ago. uh, It was around Thanksgiving and I was living up in the Portland, Oregon area. And, uh, which is close to where I went to high school. And I was just like, you know what? You know, I I don't have a whole lot going on. It's like a day or two before Thanksgiving. And I I don't know, like, you know, sometimes you find yourself in that little kind of slump. Um, every once in a while, you just, not that you're like moping around, but like, I don't know, there's some sort of like, there's an ounce of emptiness or just, just something. You just kind of feel blah. You know what I mean? And, uh, I was just like, you know what? I'm going to Google some sort of shelter. I want to go volunteer. And, um, and so, yeah, so I, I found a place downtown Portland. Uh, I think it was, uh, the Episcopal church and in the evening hours, they actually open up their church as a shelter for about four, four and a half hours in, in the evening. And, um, so I was like, all right, I'm doing it. So, you know, made my way out to the train hop the train. As soon as I step off, it's raining, it's windy, it's cold. I mean, this is like late November, right? So, uh, the weather's not, not too pretty. And already I'm just kind of like, you know, man, you know, what the fuck am I doing? Like, you know, when you do things in the moment and you're like, this is a good idea. And then like, when it's actually time to do that, you're like, it's not a good idea. Or you start kind of second guessing yourself. That's kind of what happened. So I step off the train and I have to walk like half a mile. That's as close as the train could get me. And so I start walking up this huge hill, block after block, get to the top, start walking down. By this time, I can feel my socks getting wet. You know when like you're wearing like crappy shoes and rainwater just starts seeping through the bottom and you're just like, fuck, like I'm fucked. Um, until I get home, I'm going to walk around with icy cold frozen fucking feet for a while. And so anyways, I make it to this church and I was there a little bit early. People were kind of camping outside the church. They're already waiting for the church to open. And I think it was opening at like, I don't know, six o'clock. And, uh, uh, there was this, this man outside who looked like somebody who was homeless. He was just like, Hey, you know, what are you doing? You know, are you here for the church? And yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm here to volunteer. Really kind guy, uh, walks me over to the entrance of the church and uh, rings the doorbell, knocks on the door, and one of the staff guys comes down and grabs me. And uh, so we walk up, and uh, it's just a few minutes, you know, before before the opening. 
And so I'm just kind of getting a quick little tour of the shelter or makeshift shelter. And, um, and yeah, as, as we kind of walk in, uh, there's this big, huge room with a bunch of couches, a TV where they play movies. They have a big stack of, of board games, um, chess, dominoes, all that sorts of stuff to the corner of the room. Then they had this little small kitchen that was only for staff. They would use it to uh, make sandwiches and things like that, brew coffee, whatever they were going to pass out that evening at the shelter. And um, uh, the restroom, they had one small, like grotesque looking bathroom, like rusted down. Like, you know, that opening scene in the first Saw movie when like they wake up and they're chained to the bathtubs and it's, it's. It's this gnarly rusted bathroom out of hell. Like it's just, it was just like that. Um, and so men and women would both share that restroom. Um, so yeah, so I'm getting this tour. I see the restroom. We keep walking around. Um, just in general, I mean, obviously it looked like a church inside, but um, I don't know. I, I just kind of got this sort of sinking feeling and I don't know if it was just because I was, you know, I knew that, um, you know, it was, it was sort of refuge for, for homeless people or, or people who were just less fortunate than I was or, or whatever the circumstance was. I just kind of got this sort of sinking feeling as I was kind of walking around. Um, like it was real, you know what I mean? It's, you know, one thing's getting on your laptop and signing up for a volunteer event and then actually going and, and sort of walking the walk, right. is different. Um, throughout the night, we did things like handing out sandwiches. Um, and when I say handing out sandwiches, um, you know, I'm talking like basic wonder bread, slice of cheese, couple little slices of Turkey. Um, you know, that was it. Um, it was, it was pretty scarce. And if you were a vegetarian, you basically had nothing to, to hand out. Um, you know, I remember, uh, there was one guy as I was volunteering that night. Um, who said he was vegetarian I'm passing out sandwiches and I have nothing to offer this guy and this guy's like visibly in pain like his stomach hurt and he's just like hey man you know do you have anything that's vegetarian I just can't eat meat it's like no man I'm sorry I have nothing you know I mean I guess you could remove the the turkey or whatever it is the sandwich had and just eat the bread but he's like no 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 I, I can't do it and he's like visibly like in pain like he just hey I think he had told me he hadn't eaten in like a day. So, you know, just reality hits pretty hard. And this is, you know, six o'clock and we're closing up at like 10, 1030. So I have like four and a half hours to go this. Um, and uh, yeah, like I said, reality just kind of set in. Um, they had this thing where they would tell you that if, if, if you were on the shift or the turn, and I guess I should explain that. So basically... There are like five or six staff members that volunteer each night um, and they rotate. So every hour you're doing something different. Maybe for the first hour you're passing out sandwiches. The next hour, maybe you're playing board games or just kind of chatting it up with with someone who's hanging out, just kind of chilling. Um, or, you know, maybe you're, you're watching the hallways or restrooms or whatever. So um, you just basically take turns throughout the night and... Um, they had this thing when you were passing out sandwiches, uh, as a volunteer, you actually had to pass the sandwich yourself to the person receiving the sandwich. They were not allowed to grab off of your plate or platter. Um, and at first I was just kind of like, wait, like why, why couldn't they, um, you know, grab, you know, something from the tray themselves. You always think to like those fancy parties when they're like, you know, offering the, the platters of, um, I don't know, cheese and crackers or maybe glasses of champagne and you just kind of pick one off the platter. It's just kind of like, well, why the hell would we not let them do that? Like, like what's, what's the deal? And the way it was explained was basically sometimes when one person touches a sandwich, he might put it back down and grab another that he looks more appealing. And then after that person had touched the first sandwich, no one else is going to want to eat it because they know that that person touched it. Um, the thing is, is everyone's kind of jam packed in this big TV room waiting for these sandwiches. And a lot of these people haven't eaten for hours, right? For hours. And, and you know, who knows, you know, like that, like that one guy, he hadn't eaten for like a day. So these people, this is their only meal, right? This is their only meal of the day. 
and uh, so they're they're literally their eyes are locked on you the whole time, and so they can basically tell you which more or less they can tell you which sandwich they want, and you just hand it to them. Um, once everyone had gotten at least one sandwich, we could then start kind of passing out extras throughout the room. Um, there weren't many. I think maybe at most you could get an extra one. Um, and it was really honestly just based on some folks choosing not to eat, you know, whether they were a vegetarian or they were sleeping. That was another thing is it's like you look around this big TV room and they have a bunch of couches and chairs. Some of these guys are passed out or some of these women are passed out. Some of them are, are talking. Some of them are watching TV or a movie or playing a board game. Um, you just have a mix of different folks. Um, you know, the, a lot of these people are right off the street. These are people who live in the streets and these makeshift tents built with tarps when it's 30, 35 degrees outside, windy, cold, raining. It's just, um, it's, it's their only source of refuge. If you could even call it that. Right. So later that night, it was time for the staff rotation after I helped pass out sandwiches, um, it was my turn to watch the restroom. I was like, okay, well, this should be easy. So they set me up. They, I, I, I'm basically sitting in this chair right outside of the restroom. And people form this line as they wait for the restroom. Uh, I think in the shelter we had like, I don't know, maybe 60 people there that night. So there's always at least like two or three people waiting for the restroom. And my job is to sit there with a stopwatch and to time these people in the restroom. As the clock hits three minutes, you're supposed to knock twice on the restroom door. As the clock hits three and a half minutes, you knock twice on the restroom door. As the clock reaches like four minutes, then it's like, oh shit, you know, you got to call the supervisor. Uh, they might be doing drugs. They're taking longer than they should be. There are time limits to use the restroom. And you got to understand, you know, for me, a lot of this was just so confusing. I, I just... First of all, the time limit in general, it just sucks. It fucking sucks. I mean, if you, you know, when you're at your home, how often do you time yourself in the restroom? I sure as hell know I don't time myself in the restroom. You know, um, I couldn't even tell you how long, you know, how long I'm in the restroom or how much time I spend in the restroom. Uh, you know, part of that sort of depends on how often I'm watching like YouTube or something or like listening to Pandora while I'm in the restroom. Anyways, point is, is uh, that threw me off. Second thing is, for a lot of these people, again, they're on the streets and this is their only opportunity maybe to use a restroom or to shave or to brush their teeth or maybe to, to start cleaning their bodies or washing up in the sink. There was no shower in this restroom. So a lot of people, as the supervisor explained to me, is a lot of people will take this opportunity to basically shower up, right? They'll just take off their shirt, their pants, whatever. And they'll try and wash up in the sink as best they can. Um, I, at least for me, I can't speak for everyone, but at least for me, I know it's tough to take a four minute shower. Now imagine taking a four minute sink shower. Um, that's, that's not easy. Um, so, and for other people, Sure, there, there, there are there are some people who do who do kind of use that that sort of privacy or time in the restroom with a locked door um, to do drugs. Um, it was explained to me some people do do that. At the same time, I I think about it. If I'm homeless and every minute of my day is spent out in public view, in some sort of doorway or under a bridge, right under a fucking bridge. This is my only time to be alone, insulated. Like think back to when you were a kid, right? Where was the one place, um, if, if you were lucky enough to have your own room, where was the right, where was the one place you would go to find isolation and privacy and be on your own and, you know, with your own thoughts and just away from your parents or whatever was bothering you, your, your bedroom, your isolation was your refuge. It's just one more example of, of what that could mean to someone, you know, um, so I'm sitting there with a stopwatch and I, I think it happened like three or four different times where they would reach four minutes. I would knock on the door 
And I would even give him like an extra like 30 seconds. Like I was dreading having to call over the supervisor to help out with this. But eventually you call the supervisor and they come over, they knock on the door. And usually when the supervisor did that, it was kind of like, all right, you know, shit's real. And they would hurry up and finish up and, and come out of the restroom. Um, that was, that was tough though. Um, obviously for them, but you know, I, I have to admit it was, it was tough for me. Um, yeah. So as we do these rotations throughout the night, um, you know, we, we get a chance to kind of see how the, how the house sort of operates, how the food's cooked, sandwiches are made, drinks are made. Um, how the, how the people there actually really, really interact with each other. Uh, there's really a sense of like, at least for me, there was a sense of camaraderie. I felt like a lot of the people who showed up at that shelter that night seemed to kind of know each other or they were at least comfortable talking to one another. Um, and honestly, that was really cool and something I didn't really think about or expect before I went. Um, you know, it, it is, it is sad to think that, you know what, if they do, sort of know each other from going to that shelter they're like regulars basically at that shelter and that that's a shitty concept to be a regular at a shelter that's shitty that fucking sucks um so in in retrospect um yeah it it sucked um at one point in the night i remember a staff member coming up to me it was just after I finished my rotation at the, at the restrooms, a staff member comes up to me with this young girl, you know, maybe, maybe 19, 20 years old. And it's like, look, you know, um, every once in a while, when someone comes along with, you know, beat up pants, beat up shirt, maybe needs a jacket or, or maybe even they have holes in their shoes, we'll try and do our best to, to provide them with, with something, not brand new items, but recycled, you know, goodwill type type items. And in the basement of this church, they keep an inventory of clothes for women, for men, for kids and shoes for, for young women, like, like this, uh, like this girl who had come up to us. And so I was told to go down. I was given the shoe size and I went down and tried to pick out some, some cool shoes for her. Uh, went down, found some, and, uh, you know, luckily she, she loved them and was much happier. I mean, I, I just, you know, it just, uh, I don't know that there's like this overwhelming wave of guilt that sort of comes over you when you're in that situation. Um, like think about how many times, uh, like for example, I, I'm walking away from the train station. I'm heading to the church to go volunteer and I'm fucking complaining. I'm, I'm literally like pissed off at myself because rainwater is seeping into my shoes. Um, you know, temporarily, you know, while I go volunteer and then go back home to my, my cozy wonderland. Um, it, it's like this wave of guilt that just kind of comes over you and, um, it just kind of makes you feel like shit and it's, it's a good thing, right? I I, honestly, I, I think it's a good thing. It really puts things into perspective and, uh, really makes you appreciate, really makes you think about what you really have. And, um, and, uh, really, really keeps things real. Um, so after I, I found the pair of shoes, you know, after that, it was, um, my rotation to, to go back to the TV room with all the lounges or, or couches or whatever you want to call it. People playing dominoes and board games. Um, as the clock moved closer to that 10 30 close, uh, I, I at least got the feeling that nobody was sort of dreading having to leave the shelter. And that was on my mind from the first minute I walked in there. I was like, man, you know, I'm dreading just kind of being here. I was like, they got to be dreading going back out in the cold, 30, 35 degree weather to spend the rest of the night out in the cold. They have to be dreading that. And uh, I don't know, like it, it made an impression on me. The fact that people there weren't bitter. I, I never had one interaction again, like 60 people showed up that night. I never had one interaction where somebody was just tremendously bitter or pissed off or angry, not one. And I talked to a lot of people. Um, 
uh, that really made an impression on me. And as far as those conversations that I had with those people, um, I, you know, I think naturally, I at least, I think so anyway, I, I at least try to be an outgoing person. Um, it, I think it comes natural to me. Um, I, I think it's out of good. Um, it's not something I'm trying to force. Um, but, uh, certainly in a situation like this where, you know, I, I kind of come in with the, with the pretense that you know, a lot of these people are suffering. Um, you know, I'm just there to do anything I can to kind of bring comfort any way I can. And so if it's striking up a conversation with somebody, uh, with a 65 year old man who should be retired, you know, living off some sort of retirement fund or maybe even social security, whatever, uh, you know, living his golden years, not in a fucking shelter. I'll sit down and I'll chat with that 65 year old bastard. I'll fucking chat with him. Um, and I'll have a damn good time too. And, uh, you know, so it just kind of, it, it just kind of shocked me that at least visibly to me, it didn't seem like anybody was really dreading going back outside, but that was on my mind every second, every second. And, um, before we actually closed up the shelter, I had one last shift at the bathrooms. So I'm a veteran now, right? I've been at the bathrooms at the stopwatch. I'm good to go. Uh, a few minutes before we close, there's this one guy who's standing in line at the restroom and he starts just striking up a conversation with me. Just, just like anybody else would, like one of your friends would. We're talking about sports, we're talking about movies, politics, whatever. We're literally shooting the shit. And uh, he could tell instantly it was my first time there without even asking me. He, he, he'd obviously never seen me before. Um, and, uh, and, and it was, I'm sure at least, you know, to me, it, I don't think I gave off any type of vibe like fish out of water. But, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. They, they read me for sure. And as we kind of continued that conversation, um, I started asking him more and more about what landed him in that shelter or why he was there that night. And he started to tell me that, you know, he was like 19 years old. He was living with his parents. He was really, really bad into drugs and they'd have a bunch of conversations with them. They threatened that they were going to kick him out if he didn't stop using drugs and not to mention bringing the drugs into the house. And eventually they just got fed up. They were just like, enough is enough. Like we're fucking kicking you out. Like you're out. So at 19 years old, he's out of the house and he has no place to go. And, uh, even though he was homeless, he told me that for the past six months, he was still showing up to work at six 30 in the morning at a food processing plant in Portland at six 30 in the morning. I was like, dude, how the fuck do you sleep? I was like, you do 12 hour shifts at a food processing plant. Where the fuck do you sleep? How do you work? If you have to, you know, find some sort of comfort or refuge out in the cold, what the fuck are you doing? Uh, you know, how do you do it? And again, it was that moment of guilt, that just wave of discomfort. And you're just, I can't tell you how many times, and maybe this is the case with you. I can't tell you how many times I wake up on a Monday or a Tuesday. I look at that alarm clock and I'm just blah, alarm clock. I'm, I'm getting wasted. I look at that alarm clock and I hit the snooze or I'm pissed off. I'm instantly angry. My heart starts racing and I'm just like, fuck it. Like, fuck this. Like, fuck, fuck work. Like, fuck my responsibilities. Like, why the hell do I have to get up right now? And as I, as I thought about that in that moment, I'm thinking this guy is sleeping outside in the cold in a doorway somewhere and in 30 degree, 35 degree weather, maybe he doesn't even sleep. Who knows if he sleeps? Maybe he just shivers himself the whole night. And yet he shows up to work at 630 in the morning. I ask him why, why, why? And he's like, you know what, man, it's the only place where I can go, right? It's the only place where I know it'll be warm, 
Nobody really looks down on me. Nobody knows I'm homeless. Nobody judges me. And it's the place where I know I can get free hot coffee. A nice cup of joe. And he's like, you know, for those 12 hours, I feel normal. For those 12 hours, I'm not that fucking homeless degenerate out on the street in Portland. I'm a person. People address me by my name. And man, you know, you want to talk about guilt and just feeling like a fucking piece of shit, you know? Um, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to be honest. Uh, didn't feel so good. And, um, in an ideal world, I don't think it should take that. If that's fair to say, I don't, I don't think it should take volunteering at a shelter to make you pause and really think, wow, you know what? I, I am very thankful and appreciative for what I have in this life. It, it shouldn't take that. Um, and just leveling with you, um, that, that was, that was, that was real talk, right? Um, that was tough, but, um, but it was good. It was good to sort of have that, um, you know, real moment and, and just kind of think about everything that I have, you know, whether it's being able to just hang out with a friend, see family, run with the bulls, uh, you know, whatever it is that, that you're thankful for. And, um, um, like I said, it, it, it would, it would be nice if it didn't take that, but you know, maybe sometimes it does. And maybe that's why, uh, you know, there's always something else we can do. Um, um, you know, whether it's helping the community or helping a friend or, or whatever, uh, there's always something else you can do with your life and, and ways to kind of, um, use your time more productively. That's for sure. Um, so yeah, you know, as, as we're closing up, you know, the guy, this guy thanks me, uh, and, uh, right as he's thanking me just for this chat, one of the supervisors comes by and they're like, Hey, Andrew, you know, thanks so much for coming out tonight. This is the first time we saw you, but Hey, you know, we, we really want you to come back, like come back. Like we need more volunteers. Uh, the shelter's always looking for more people. And as soon as he says that this, this guy I'm chatting with, right. He looks over and he's like, dude why would this guy come back? Like, why the fuck would this guy want to come back to this place? Like, why? Like, he's not coming back. No way. I guarantee he's not coming back. And in that, in that moment, you're just, you feel kind of caught off guard. And, you know, in, uh, I don't know, in that moment, um, you know, I just kind of said, Oh man, you know, come on, dude, like I'll be back. Come on. Like, you know, I had a great night. This was a lot of fun. You know, like I, I, I just loved being here. This was great. I think it's like a Friday night, something like that. Like, you know, I'm literally kind of lying through my teeth and I'm sure he fucking knew. Um, yeah, I don't even know that it was lying. I, I don't even think at that point I knew whether I would or would not go back. I, I was just trying to digest that night or even make it through that night. Uh, there was just so much going on. I, I don't even think I was able to process anything, anything after that. But again, you know, you want to, come off as dick. And the first thing I said was, dude, trust me, I'll be back. So we help everyone out of the shelter. After everyone's out, we sweep, we mop the floors. We go to the small kitchen and we shut down the place for the night. And it was about, a, I don't know, maybe like close to 11. And, uh, and you know, that was it. You know, my, my four or five hour shift, whatever it was. It was in the books and, uh, you know, it, it went by pretty slow. Um, again, it was just tough to kind of absorb everything that was happening. Um, even though I, I honestly had good conversations with people, um, and I really felt good about what I was doing. It was, it was a lot. It was just a lot. Um, it had been a while since I really volunteered like that. Again, this is a couple of years ago. In college, I did some volunteering. Um, even after college, I did a little bit of volunteering. In high school, I did a lot of volunteering. So I wasn't new to that. Um, but it had just been so long um, since I had just kind of been taken out of my own little reality. Um, you know, and, and like I said at the start of this podcast, you know, 
I read that prompt on Facebook a couple days back. That little white text box just blinking with those little prompt letters. What makes you happy? What makes you happy, Ander? And, uh, you know, again, I, I, I really thought long and hard about that volunteer experience. And for whatever reason it popped into my head, it popped into my head. So, um, you know, it's, it's, even though I know I had done a good thing, I, I had always looked back on that volunteer experience with mixed emotions. Um, but when this happened a few days ago and I thought about it, I really challenged myself. I was like, okay, like why the fuck is that happening? Like, like, why do I have to look back on that with mixed emotions? I know that volunteering at the shelter was a great thing. We, we helped and served about 60 people that night, provided new shoes, new clothes. Uh, we, we, we tried to give them a, a decent meal or snack and, and tried to show them compassion. And uh, I knew that I had, I had done a good thing, but I still had mixed emotions about that. So I challenged myself. Um, And yeah, you know, I, I I think that's important too, is, is at least to try not to lie to yourself. (laughs) It's like, um, you know, I heard, uh, I heard someone tell me one time, um, you know, in their early twenties, late twenties, even into their thirties, one of the biggest issues they had was failing to take responsibility for their own actions in their own life. And they realized that as soon as they started taking more responsibility, things really turned around for them. Um, and it's, it's important, I think, to figure out why you feel a certain way. Um, but anyways, um, I challenged myself on that. And uh, like I said, it, it didn't ring synonymously with happiness. Um, you know, in retrospect, I, um, I don't know. I, I feel like I had entered this alternate reality. Like I keep talking about this reality. I feel like I had entered this alternate, alternate reality away from my house, away from my bedroom, my comfy mattress, a hot shower, private untimed bathroom, my refrigerator filled with food that if you're anything like, if you're anything like me, it's, it's, you fill the fridge with food. You eat like a third of it. You throw everything out by the end of the week and, and you're just a wasteful person. So I have this luxurious comfort, right? In, in my home and not to mention a thermostat that you can just toggle up and down at the touch of a finger. Um, just, it's just incredible. And, uh, while these other people at the shelter, left that night to go freeze their asses off in the cold winter. Um, but I, I just, I, I thought back to how happy they were during those four or five hours that the shelter was open. And I just couldn't for the life of me fucking figure out why the hell they were so damn happy. You know, um, I don't know. They, they, even as the night drew to a close, they never really seemed to dread going back out. And I, I just, just couldn't figure it out. Um, yeah, just, just couldn't, just couldn't pinpoint it. Um, I mean, these guys were like laughing, playing games, watching movies, watching TV. We lived in two different realities. Um, and if any of those people are still homeless, we still live in two different realities. And for those five or six hours, whatever it was, uh, they were on cloud nine. They were living the high life. They were eating warm food. They were watching movies. I think for a few hours, they kind of forget about their lives outside in the cold, their true reality. The time they had at this shelter was an escape, a time away from that reality. It was, in many ways, maybe it was some sort of luxury uh, to them. Um, you know, mine mine was much different, both outside the shelter and inside the shelter. Outside, obviously, like I talked about, I'm living this awesome life, right? I'm not homeless. I'm living this awesome life. And inside, um, you know, 
it just showed me a side of life that was uncommon to my day-to-day experience. You know, so when I think about what makes me happy, I think my sort of resolution, my goal, right, is to try to be better at appreciating the reality that I'm blessed with and the people who care about me and how I care about them thankful for this fucking awesome glass of of red wine of tempranillo and the ability to to do this to share my thoughts with you guys my feelings with you on this podcast that makes me happy and from time to time i really think i should remind myself that um that that that's important and uh, not everyone is blessed with that so I, I think it it also means that I have to do a better job of volunteering. I think it, I should do it more often and, and really put myself to the challenge. You know, fuck, you know, who cares if I feel uncomfortable? Um, and maybe the next time I volunteer, who knows? Maybe I maybe I don't feel quite as uncomfortable as I did that night at the at the shelter in, in downtown Portland. But even if I did, fuck, what if I felt more, more uncomfortable? Uh, I think it's important to remember that it's not just about you. It's not just about me. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think I can feel uncomfortable for four or five, six hours if I'm making a world of difference. If just for one night, if just for a few hours, I'm making a world of difference for 60 other people. That's important. And, um, and yeah, that's, that's my takeaway. Um, so anyways, that's the podcast for the night guys. Uh, like I said, nothing crazy. Um, a couple days ago when I was on Facebook again, I I saw that prompt and really kind of challenged myself to think long and hard about what it really means to be happy and, and, uh, and really, uh, the the fact that I should be extremely happy and thankful and, and really feel blessed that I have the life that I have, uh, And you should feel the same because there are a lot of people out there who have it much worse, much, much worse. Um, so, you know, Hey, look, cheers to volunteering. Cheers to life. Cheers to wine. Here's to grapes on the lips under the cork tree. Uh, let's rock on. Uh, we only have, uh, October, November, December. We got like less than three months left of this year. Let's fucking rock on. And uh, let's kill it in uh, 2018. All right, you guys. Talk soon. Have a good night. Take care.